message is unequivocal. Torah, Torah, Torah. It is December 7th, 1941. The day of infamy. The day war comes to America. At 7.55 a.m., hell broke loose. Man-made hell. Made in Some people refer to it as a surprise attack and some people refer to it as a brilliant naval strategy, but uh, it's a sneak attack. You're damn mad. I don't think I was ever as mad in my life as I was that morning that they caught us flat-footed. Yet within hours, the U.S. is once again caught flat-footed. A second air raid destroys an American bomber force in the Philippines. A second. But that story is glossed over in the history books. And the two men at the center of these defeats suffer different fates. Theirs is the story of blame and blunder. The man who watched his battleships go up in flames at Pearl Harbor, Admiral Husband Kimmel, would bear the disgrace for the rest of his life. My father spent all of his life trying to get the record straight on Pearl Harbor. I want my father's reputation, honor, uh, restored. But the man who ignored the warnings of Pearl Harbor and allowed his bomber force to be destroyed on the ground became a living military legend. His name, General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur's reaction should have had him relieved from duty and sent home in disgrace. December 7th, the day the United States suffered the most humiliating defeat in its history. It will become the battle cry for a nation going to war. 1941. The world is being divided up by two conquering powers. The Nazis have overrun Europe and are perched on England's doorstep. In Asia, the Japanese Imperial Army is proving to be as ruthless and efficient as the German Blitzkrieg. Nation after nation falls, with little or no resistance. The Japanese now have total domination of the continent within their grasp. American President Franklin Roosevelt is fearful that Japan has become a dangerous threat. But he is also the leader of a bitterly divided country. He is attacked by the anti-war isolationists who accuse him of being a warmonger for supporting Great Britain. The isolationists are led by the popular aviator hero, Charles Lindbergh. The imminent danger of war lies in the action taken by President Roosevelt and his supporters. He was considered a stooge of English interests in general, of English business interests, of English political interests, uh, and certainly uh, unpatriotic because he didn't put America first. Roosevelt Sopanis aggression is to impose an oil embargo. Without oil, the Japanese military machine would grind to a halt. For Japan, this is tantamount to war and unleashes an urgency within the Japanese military to attack the oil-rich Dutch East Indies, Indonesia. The only obstacle, the United States Navy. The port of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii is the Hossev Fortress that harbors scores of huge, well-armed battleships, destroyers, and aircraft carriers. Husband Kimmel. Neither he nor the brightest military minds believe that the Japanese would decrecy to launch an attack on what is supposed to be an impregnable stronghold. The thinking 
in the military and also in the highly placed people in the administration in Washington was that it was highly unlikely that Pearl Harbor would be the object of an attack by the Japanese. My father has admitted uh, would attack Pearl Harbor and none of those damn fools did either. The military command is sure that if an attack comes, it will be aimed at the Philippines, an American protectorate. The Philippines are close to Formosa, where the Japanese have a huge bomber force. President Roosevelt installs General Douglas MacArthur, an American hero of the First World War, to head the defense of the Philippines. MacArthur is sent a force of state-of-the-art B-17 bombers as a show of strength. The Philippines are bolstered at the expense of Pearl Harbor. Admiral Kimmel discovers that his requests for reinforcements and equipment are denied. Everything in... Kimmel constant ships and aircraft and trained personnel that he needed not only to defend uh, Pearl Harbor, but to make war against the Japanese when war broke out. He did not have the aircraft that he required. He had asked for other equipment that had never been sent. Uh, he had asked for uh, new anti-aircraft guns with which to equip his ships at Pearl Harbor, and those were not sent to him. Kimmel is also denied something much more valuable. Military intelligence it's had a secret weapon. It's Khan's naval and the intercepts from one of the machines are so spectacular, they're called magic. Magic reveals that the Japanese are parallel. Other, more precise intelligence shows that Japan is intensely preoccupied with harbor, even detailing the time it takes battleships to get to their moorings. The interesting thing about that is that the man who, who decoded that message and presented it to the powers that be interesting, and the message was sent to the high command, and it was sent to, uh, to the secretary of the Navy, and they all had access to it, and nobody did a damn thing about it. That crucial piece of information is never passed on to the Pearl Harbor base commander, Admiral Kimmel. At one time, Kimmel had received all the magic intercepts, but now, inexplicably, he is frozen out. Kimmel begins to conclude that the defense of Pearl Harbor is no longer a high priority, and that he and his army chief, General Short, need not fear a Japanese attack. Somebody said, well, Kimmel and Short were sentinels out there at Pearl Harbor. Ridiculous. The sentinels were in Washington, where they had all of the, the secret information, the magic uh, information, and the best brains in the country to try to integrate it and, and put it into some form where it really, really meant something. And yet they didn't do it. A top security military compound the Japanese high command assemble in the war room. The exact plan for the conquest of Southeast Asia is unveiled step by step. Hundreds of Japanese Navy pilots begin specialized training using a mock-up of the moorings and air bases at Pearl Harbor. They fly full dress rehearsals until their attacks are flawless. Then, in late November, the fleet of warships slips out of harbor. They take the northern route in seas so rough they're gambling they will encounter Sun's plane. They must travel over 4,000 miles in total secrecy. It seems an impossible mission. As the day dawns, Sunday morning, December 7th, most of Pearl Harbor is sleeping. The ships along Battleship Row are at low alert. Many have even left their watertight doors and ports wide open to ventilate the sleeping quarters. 
The previous evening, there'd been a battle of the bands, a Saturday night tradition in town. The band from the USS Arizona had been one of the star attractions. Within a few minutes on this Sunday morning, every one of them would be dead. The fleet's commander, Admiral Kimmel, has risen early for his Sunday morning round of golf. By day's end, his Navy career would be in ruins. The sleeping Pacific fleet, a Japanese strike force of 20 ships and 335 aircraft has materialized as if by magic. The Japanese maintained radio silence the whole distance, and yet they managed to make their intended rendezvous at uh, a position north of Oahu and to launch their aircrafts uh, just at the break of day and to reach Oahu on plane or submarine or surface craft. It was an incredible feat. No one knew it yet, but the Japanese had not gone completely undetected. Any submarine is spotted two miles outside the harbor. The sighting is judged a false alarm and never reported. Then, just one hour before the raid, another mini-sub is no alarm bells. Wind, and the attack planes are warming up their engines on the flight decks. There were military rituals uh, on board the ship. Some men uh, also uh, wore as scarves around their necks uh, flags that they had been given something to the order of seeing when the first aircraft begin to lift off a hundred and eight they are saluted by the ship's crews as they strike out most of them tip to wingtip the better to guard against sabotage in the harbor the ships of the fleet have not yet raised their flag or of the island eyes at two minutes after Sarge's flight of planes, officer believes the blips are the flight of B-17s expected in from California. Don't worry about it, he tells the radar man. By 7.40, the blips are passing overhead. At 7.55 breakfast, after signing off for the midnight watch. And I was lying in my bunk. I can recall like yesterday, my hands were behind my head. And I'm thinking to myself, what a life, trying to talk a nurse into something or other and expecting a great day. And all of a sudden, I heard the high-pitched sound of planes in a dive. Green Prandy paper. Some of them, and just about that time, I heard somebody holler, the Japs are bombing the hell out of the docks. Well, that's all. California temperature. First, I draw the the magazine keys from the armory and went down and started taking my temperatures when I'm they were right down and we could see the plane very plain they were very close we could see the pilots see the torpedoes we could see a pedo man first lawyer aylwin me and a, one of my friends manned the 50 caliber machine guns amidships we were shooting at the planes of course we don't know if we got it or not but I know one thing for sure, the strafing cut off my water hoses. I kept shooting, and the next thing I know, the darn gun was on fire. The attack has been raging for 20 minutes before the Pacific Fleet sent out the official signal. I was, and it was, uh, it said, air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. In a matter of minutes, the fighters and dive bombers make short work of the aircraft that have been locked. On Ford Island, the amphibious patrol planes drawn up in rows on their concrete slips are blown apart. But the fiercest attack is reserved for the battleships. The mighty Arizona.
takes a direct bomb hit in her forward magazine. There was gigantic sheets of what looked like corrugated tin flying through the air. We learned later on that that was 18-inch armor. So you can imagine the force. At the head of battleship row, the Oklahoma is ripped open by torpedoes. Everywhere in the harbor now, there is smoke and fun. I think it was just one pall of smoke. I don't know how those guys live. I could see men uh, jumping out of the fire on the ship and into the fire in the water. And uh, this just boggled the mind almost. The fuel oil was so darn thick that you couldn't use any kind of evasive action uh, but it, to, to get it away from you. You just had to dive back under and swim some more. At 9 o'clock Pacific time, word finally reaches President Roosevelt that Pearl Harbor is in flames. He is stunned. His Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, is still meeting with Japanese diplomats in last-ditch talks to avoid war. Hull orders them out of his office and mutters to an aide, scoundrels and pissants. In Pearl Harbor, there is a sudden lull as the first weapon strike is just minutes away. In Pearl Harbor, it is nine o'clock when the second wave of the attack strikes. At Hickam Field, the ground defenses are now so including some of their own aircraft as they try to land. But it didn't last because they all opened up on this thing. The sugar cane field right next to where we were parked there, and you could actually hear the bullets hitting into the sugar cane. I mean, there must have been a hundred million rounds fired at that airplane. It didn't stand a chance. In the harbor, a spectacular explosion literally blows the bow off the USS Shaw. The cassins and the downs are caught in birds from the heat of the fires. The crew of the crippled Nevada tries in vain to clear the harbor. We saw the Nevada come steaming down the channel, hell-bent for leather. It looked like a bunch of these Japanese planes were after that battleship. And they tunded her on the other side so she wouldn't sink and block the channel. I can still picture that battleship with the bow just going down slowly and the stern rising up. And uh, the big propeller was chopping half water and half air. And I said to my buddy there, I said, Monty, I said, we're going to see a battleship sink right out here in front of us. In less than two hours, the Japanese attack destroys or heavily damages 18 warships, 180. The final death toll is 2,403. A thousand men die on the Arizona alone. Most of them at least die quickly. Inside the capsized hull of the Oklahoma, they are not so lucky. They heard the tappings, but they, they couldn't get to them. They couldn't get to them. Around, who uh, remained alive for about 20 days after the uh, ship had been capsized. The markings on the walls and so on. And so there were men suffering gruesome deaths for days uh, in the harbor. I walked around the hospital there seeing what we could do, and they lying, lay them out in the, on the lawn there, covering up with canvas. And there must be hundreds, literally hundreds of them. You'd see a khaki, you knew he was a Marine from one of the ships. 
the smell, if you've ever smelled burning flesh, you ought to smell a couple hundred of them laying around. It's really something. I don't think I was ever as mad in my life as I was that morning that they caught us flat-footed. The Japanese pilots returned to their carriers, flushed with victory, only the losses they expected. The news of a great victory at sea reaches Japan within a few hours. One young naval cadet writes, the whole nation bubbled over, excited and inspired. My blood boiled at the news. Above the harbor, looking out across his fleet, Admiral... About 8 o'clock, he was looking, we're already beginning to burn, uh, asked a very small piece of shrapnel. And he said to the person standing next to him that he wished they had killed him. Uh, he knew that his career was over. He was finished. In Washington, Kimmel is accused of dereliction of duty, and the wrath of a nation turns against him. There was a public outcry, and my father received numerous letters suggesting that he shoot himself, and a lot of things like that. It's the Navy thinking that says the guy in charge takes the rap regardless, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, I think there was a lot of blame in Washington for poor communications with uh, Admiral Kimmel. If you're in charge, you take the rap. A nation cannot fight a war with its entire military. Roosevelt needs a scapegoat. He had to preserve uh, the confidence of the people in this country in the armed forces. And he took what actions he thought to divert attention uh, from a congressional investigation of the whole of the circumstances of the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941. All of that I can understand and I, I accept. What he should have done was after the dust sort of uh, made a clean breast of the whole thing and taken some action uh, to restore the honor and the reputation uh, of the military commanders that had been besmirched. Kimmel takes the blame for America's blackest defeat, even though he'd been denied the intelligence that might have warned him and denied the equipment that might have defended his fleet. But 10 hours later, with all the warning in the world, the U.S. Only this time, the man who blunders would be lionized as a hero. The bombs receives an urgent phone call in the Philippines telling him the U.S. is under attack. But while his staff wait for orders, the general seems caught between panic and paralysis. He immediately uh, called for his wife and asked his wife to bring him his Bible. He sat on the edge of his bed and he read his Bible. He uh, issued no orders, no orders whatever, for hours and hours. Uh, yet, uh, there were many things that had to be done. There has 35 B-17 bombers and scores of fighters. His orders are, if hostilities break out, he is to go on the attack. The obvious target is the Japanese air base at Formosa, 300 miles away. Carthur's air chief could not even get his attention. In fact, I don't think even Sutherland who said, can't go bomb Formosa. And that's the information that we had. You know. So it became apparent early on that... We... MacArthur ignores his orders to attack. Instead, now six hours after he... without a mission. To uh, fly around the air do, and we flew around and gave our gunners practice tracking on the clouds that were around. We were just circling the, circling that area. There was no, no uh, mission involved then except to, to sting uh, in the air. Round, an attack force of nearly 200 Japanese aircraft is almost on top of them. Then U.S. planes are called back down. They uh, called all our squadron in to land. 
over to barracks, which is next door, and to go back to the flight line. We stand in front of the hangar, or uh, just kind of uh, getting ready to go back to work, and uh, he's up there. And somebody said, Nate. Almost 10 hours after attacking Pearl Harbor, the Japanese are astonished that again they encounter no reasons defenseless on the ground. All the, the grounds, it threw you around just like it was an earthquake or something. We were all scared. I mean, we jumped in our trenches and, and uh, just hoping that they'd miss us. So. Four to six guys could get in easy and in an emergency like that, jumping on top of each other, well, there probably a dozen of us was in there. And they would come in there real low on the ground, swish tailing like that. Then they'd pull right up over the, over the building and go right up and we'd watch them. You could see the pilot and everything, and then he'd come back down uh, trying to stray something close in. Boy, one of them came across that was low. Uh, you could have thrown rocks at him, he was so low. There were a few people firing their guns, 45s and whatnot, at these airplanes, but uh, a 45 isn't a very uh, effective weapon against an airplane. I think I said at the time, I said, so this is war. <laughs> it, it came as a, what, how bad it could really be. The first thing I saw were body parts en route to the flight line. And um, I looked in the cavity of someone's uh, uh, head that has been blown off. Um, saw intestines for the first time laying along a body. And it was a, it was a pretty gruesome sight for a young 20-year-old kid from Iowa. And in the center of Clark Field was a P-40. And the pilot who had attempted to take off during the raid, plane caught fire and he was at the stick. His hand was frozen, he was completely charred, and of course, uh, uh, very, very, very dead. At his headquarters in Manila, MacArthur hears by phone that more than a hundred of his planes attack had come from Formosa, the Japanese airbase he'd been urged to attack hours earlier. But instead of being in the air, his pilot... The planes mostly was what uh, impressed me, uh, losing all those on the ground was seemed like a terrible thing. The decision to keep the airplanes on the ground was a bad mistake, because they could have gotten off and you got a little bit better chance. If MacArthur let us go in the morning, we probably would have uh, caught the force that got us. And we knew they came from Formosa, and why hadn't we done something about it earlier? That was my, I think that was my early thoughts. We should have been in the air with bombs on board and get lots of gas and heading for Formosa. MacArthur cables back to Washington that everyone had put up a valiant effort, but they'd been caught by overwhelming air superiority. He never has to explain why his planes were sitting ducks on the ground. He is a popular general with friends in high places. I think all do exploit MacArthur despite all of MacArthur's failings. And instead of, um, when he became a four-star general, the result was that of the island hopping north, the man who promised uh, that I shall return to the Philippines uh, and did return, uh, and eventually he, uh, who left us uh, in a mess in the Philippines on the first day of the war. But the humiliation felt by Americans on that first day of the war soon turns to anger. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of the Pacific. Of Spread today over a 5,000 mile front, the United States following yesterday's shattering and unprovoked attacks by the Japanese on Hawaii, the Philippines, Guam, with confidence in our termination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. On the day of that speech, 
Roosevelt and everyone else knows that Pearl Harbor has been a disaster. What they don't realize is that it has also been a disaster for Japan. It is a daring plan, brilliantly executed. But the profound irony is that the raid on Pearl Harbor turns out to be a strategic disaster that accomplishes little. Even the Japanese commander fears that he's now awakened a sleeping giant. The attack fills Americans with patriotism and burning anger. As one historian observed, never has a major power brought more defeat on itself by its own victorious action. Pearl Harbor really set the spirit for World War II. Guys, the next morning, not the next morning, the next hour, guys were lining up all over the country to sign up. Uh, you didn't have to draft them. They lined up by the hundreds of thousands and stood all night waiting to register. It, it, it united our country like it's never been. The anti-Roosevelt isolationists overnight become a spent force and wither away. America is going to war, and Pearl Harbor will be avenged. There was a lot of anger and hatred, and actually, the slogan, remember Pearl Harbor, was maintained throughout the war. It was a battle cry of almost every invasion in the Pacific. The Japanese would also remember Pearl Harbor because they'd made a tactical blunder. On the morning of December 7th, the pilots had wanted to go back for a third strike and said no, a decision he'd regret for the rest of his life. That was a huge mistake because the Japanese had failed the United States Navy out of the war for at least a year. They had failed to attack the oil farm the fuel depot, the huge uh, installations that held all of our fuel oil for ships and all of our gasoline for aircraft. They failed, and they failed to attack the submarine base with the submarines tied up alongside. If the Japanese, I say, had attacked those, and had attacked those instead of the battleships, they would have taken the Navy out of the war. The U.S. Navy was also lucky. Because Pearl Harbor is so shallow, ships that were sunk were not necessarily lost. In a massive salvage operation, many are raised and refitted to fight again. Another stroke of luck. Both aircraft carriers were out at sea when the attack came, and the Japanese strike force did not try to locate them. That turned out to be crucial because Pearl Harbor teaches the Navy that carriers, not destroyers, win battles. The carriers give the United States a decisive victory at Midway. The Navy learns another lesson. Admiral Nimitz, who replaced Kimmel, is given all the secret intelligence that was planning an attack at Midway. Admiral Kimmel spends the war years in disgrace, then spent his life trying to clear the black mark from his name. My father blamed himself for being stupid and not being able to foresee that this was going to take place. It was like a, a, a dog with his tail between his legs. But when he found out this information that had been denied to him, he turned around, that, that tail came out from between his legs, and he turned into a fighting tiger. Kimmel dies in 1968, never fully exonerated. As for Douglas MacArthur, his actions in the Philippines are never challenged and never investigated. Despite the fact, once he'd lost his aircraft on the ground, he's... ...are captured by the Thousandth March. 
Many of those who survived the Clark Field bombing wound up in the brutal Japanese POW camps where starvation, torture and death were common. Many believe history has been too kind to General MacArthur. The prisoners and, and the troops that fought under MacArthur were very disenchanted with him. You'll find that MacArthur's actions were, for the most part, a disaster. I, I marvel that there was no criticism whatever of MacArthur, who was made into a kind of demigod while Kimmel um, was hung in effigy. In the United States, the Japanese are vilified in a widespread propaganda campaign. The surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and Japanese treatment of Allied prisoners provide instant ammunition. Rescue crews are still putting out the fires in Oahu when the FBI begins rounding up Japanese aliens and then Japanese Americans. Their property is seized and they will spend the rest of the war in internment camps. The events of December the 7th engender such bitterness among Americans that President Truman knows he will face no public outcry when he orders the Enola Gay to carry the world's first atom bomb to Japan. A war that began with hundreds of planes dropping thousands of bombs ends with one and then another.